corrupt or if there's corruption within the economy, then that figure of 100 billion will be overstated because it does not include or it includes the padded corruption. And we know when you're doing public projects, the first thing that we do is to do economic uh, projections and analysis and visibility. So when we do the economic feasibility, the economic feasibility itself does not factor in the corruption component. The corruption component is normally padded after the economic feasibility has been done. So what that means is that when you're looking at the return on investment, it is misstated, it is wrong. Because it means that what has been padded probably has already wiped out that return on investment. And that's why probably you're seeing a lot of big projects and they don't seem to be having impact at the local level. And that takes us to the bad point. In a corrupt environment, most likely what is acquired corruptly is never within the economy. Now, economics are very complex and um, a, a big was animal. If, for example, you, call, you do what you're talking about corruption, but the money remains within the economy, like assuming I could steal or divert one billion from a public project, and then that money I use that money to go and build a hotel, and that hotel pays taxes and employs people within the economy. At the macro level, the economy will still be okay because the money is still within the economy. But that's not likely what happens in, 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 in where corruption is involved. And especially like in our case, we are now the financial systems are a bit strict on illegal flows. So most likely these flows will be stashed outside the country. So that means that when the money is outside the country, it means there's no domestic saving and there are no investment within the local economy. And we know in macroeconomic, these are one of the key drivers of economic growth, savings and investments. And you look at Kenya, our data, is we are one of the lowest savers in the um, globe. We are among the least countries that save. We save less than 7%. It's only in the COVID period when the savings seems to have grown up a bit, compared to countries like Singapore, where people are saving up to 40%, 50%. So it means that there's very little domestic capital to be mobilized. The fourth, um, and this is quite um, dangerous, especially looking at the young population. It accuses innovation, creativity, and the industry. Now, economies are driven by creativity and innovation and business. You can never possibly tax natural persons to success. But industry, businesses are the largest supporters of the economy because businesses can pay unlimited amount of taxes as long as they're making money. But in a corrupt jurisdiction, it distorts this, the reward system within the economy. The economy is supposed to reward the best or the most creative, uh, uh, the most productive, and the most entrepreneurial. But what corruption does, it brings the problem of what we call the, 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 the tragedy of commons. If I create, I don't get paid by the market, so why should I create? So you see our young people, if they cannot create within the economy, then it means they have to leave the economy, which we call um, uh, capital flight in terms of human resource, or they choose, simply choose not to create because they will not be rewarded. Nobody wants to put effort if they are not rewarded. So the moment we distort the ability of the economy to reward innovation, creativity, and industry, then we kill industry. And that's why you're seeing people, even people with good education, they choose not to apply their knowledge, but they choose to become entrepreneurs because entrepreneurs seems to be paying. And when you're in entrepreneurship, you're not creating anything. You're simply simply public resources. So that becomes a big trap, especially for the young population, which is supposed that becomes to be the a most trap. productive, especially for the young population, which is supposed to become a big trap. And the last one of the young population, and the last one of the young population, that should become an equal society. Because this is what corruption does. It means that capital is accumulated by a few minority, probably who are able to access state power and state resources. So what that means is that you leave a huge population of masses, which becomes a time bomb. And that's why, for example, every time we have elections, you see quick flare-ups because people have nothing to do. They do not have stake in the country. And that's why you look at countries like uh, the ones that you're talking about, countries like look Singapore, at countries like, uh, the South ones that Korea, Malaysia, about, Malaysia and the others. Singapore, Singapore, the first thing that they've done is to ensure their people have stake in the economy. They need to own properties within the country. So the moment more people are disenfranchised economically, then they have nothing to lose. And that's why they're willing to jump into any political incitement so quickly. So these are very critical uh, variables that uh, corruption negates within the economy. So when you look at religion, it doesn't harbor corruption. So the question is, why is this corruption happening? If you look at Christians, there are many Bible scriptures that speak and harbor corruption. 
When you look at the teachings of Islam, uh, the terms that refer to corruption, Fasa, Batil, and Rashwa, they are so negative that you imagine nobody want to do it. But I've said even the atheists do not encourage corruption. They do not practice corruption. So when you're looking at that data, data 6% and the 10, 11%, that already puts about 97% of the population to be affiliated to one religious community on, or the other. And you're looking at the teachings of those religious communities. And then you're looking at the practice at the economy level, and you're wondering what is or where is the disconnect? What is not happening? Now, somebody has, there are quite a number of studies that have been done, but there's one study that have been done on by Fataki, Asheri, and Kausa on Saudi Arabia. And specifically, they looked at the, uh, the, the, the Islamic faith. Because this is a country that is largely or practices the Islamic faith. And they try to understand how people relate with God and probably how that can be used to speak to corruption within the economy. And in this particular uh, paper, they described the relation with God in three areas. One, where God is seen as where God is seen as punishing. And then the second one is where God is seen as benevolent and forgiving. And then the, that attribute they looked at is a mix of the two, an hybrid of where at one point people view God as punishing, but at the same time forgiving and benevolent. Now, when they did this study, the, 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 the results were quite intriguing. They found that where people see God as punishing, they are likely going to engage in ethical practices. So they're least likely going to um, want to move towards things like corruption and ethical practices. But where the people see God as both benevolent and forgiving, they are more likely going to engage in unethical practices because they think and they believe that God is so um, forgiving that they'll be forgiven. So they can commit the crime or the unethical practice and then seek forgiveness. So the people who saw God as both benevolent and forgiving, they were more likely going to be prone towards those um, uh, issues of corruption. And where people see God as both punishing but also benevolent, they were likely going to see an ethical practice in a negative perspective. So this probably helps us to put into context what we're talking about. Probably we are saying when people feel God as a forgiving God, then they're willing to commit probably corruption and then they go and seek forgiveness. And we've seen it in our public life. For example, you look at the KEMSA uh, discussion and the KEMSA scandal. There's somebody who say they got a miracle by just walking around KEMSA and it got a 10 of 350 million and you're wondering how can god be invoked in a scandal of that nature and, and, and then you're wondering um how does this people or person relate or see god in that context and then how do you put it into perspective given this is an area where a scandal of that magnitude within a pandemic is being investigated so so this study gives us quite some intriguing uh perceptions or things that we need to think about and ponder. But now going to the crux of the topic, how does religion, politics, and the economy connect? As I've said, and as I'm going to put in this particular lecture, the three can never be separated from one another. And the three, the two, the religion and politics have a lot of relation either in direct relation or direct relation with the economy. The first thing I will look at is religion. How does religion relate with the economy? Number one, the religious institutions are part of the economy. So they are consumers in the economy. They create employment. They buy from the economy. So they provide a market for the economy. That's number one. But number two, how does religion finance its activities? They get money from the economy. But in this case, the religious community raised funds through voluntary contributions in form of tithes, sovereigns, and whichever other. And maybe when their projects are mobilized from their communities. So it means that how the economy rewards the society and the community they are serving will eventually have an implication 
on their incomes and the ability to finance their activities. If, for example, we look at like in Christianity, and we talk about the the, the, the giving about uh, tithing. Tithing is ten percent. So, if, for example, the economy only gives me a reward of say a thousand, and I'm supposed to comply with that, I can only pay a uh, hundred shillings in tithes. But if the same economy rewards me a million, and I'm then supposed to comply with the ten percent then it means I'm giving maybe 100,000 into support of religious activities. But when you look at the literature on the role of religion in the political arena, number one, literature has consensus that the religious community should avoid the, what we call the party politics directly. Because if the religious community gets involved in party politics, then they are going to be trapped in the party politics. So the religious community must maintain a different, or must be at a different level, which we call the prophetic level, meaning that the religious community must be able to speak about socioeconomic welfare that is done at the state and at the political level. So they need to be above board and avoid individual party politics. But when we have religious, among the religious flock, or the individual citizens among the religious communities involved in active politics, then they need to exercise their religious practices within the doctrines of that party. So as a community, then we need to be above board to party politics. But we have a lot of role in the political arena. We need to shape the political leadership. We need to shape um, the people elected in, into uh, politics, because now when you go to the next point, when you look at the political institutions, and as Monkley and Robinson have written about a lot about um, why nations pay, the origins of power politics, and uh, I mean, uh, the origins of power uh, and poverty and politics, they have written a lot about the relationship between political institutions and the economy. Now, the first thing that we need to appreciate is that in a democratic system like ours, the economy is in the hands of political leaders. Like you look at our two arms of government, we have the executive and the legislature. The two are under elected officials. At the executive level, we have the president and the governors. At the legislative levels, we have the legislators. Now, all these people are the ones who dictate the economic policy. They dictate other policies like foreign policy. They dictate education policy. They dictate even the business environment. So when you look at the powers conferred, for example, on the executive, which is the presidency and the governors in the country, then they have a lot of sweeping powers that can determine the outcomes at the economic level because they'll determine the development priorities. They'll also determine the allocation of resources to those priorities. They also have the control on the institutions that, for example, oversight on corruption and the corruption and all that. So you can never underestimate the power vested on the, on the executive. Now, when you look at the legislative arm, they make the laws, and those laws determine the business environment within the economy. Those laws also determine property rights which is a very key ingredient in economic growth and development. But they also have the authority to approve. They are the ones who authorize the budgets and plans proposed by the executive. But once the resources have been spent, then they are also the ones who come to oversight to ensure that the resources were spent in the right places. So when you're looking at the roles at the executive level and the roles at the legislative level, you realize they actually control the drivers of the economy. So that's why there's a lot of interest and the religious community should have a lot of interest on <coughs> the persons who get to control these political institutions. So the political institutions influence the economic institutions and they control public policy. Now, when you relate that to the economy now, we say the economy has its own universal rules. And I say this is what we call the market forces. Now, political institutions can influence the market forces, but they can never negate the ability of the market to allocate 
resources. So once the political institutions, what we call the extractive, extractive political institutions, they distort the ability of the market. So you find the market probably is not able to create employment because there was interference at the political level or the policies were not right. So there's nothing you can do if the economy is not able to create jobs. And for them, we have to put this into context. Recently, there was a law that was passed to, to establish an employment authority. An employment authority can never create jobs. It's only the economy that can create jobs. Right now, you look at the discussions happening around the bottom-up economics, the rural economics, and all these. All these discussions are rotating about household incomes and poverty and unemployment within the economy. It's only the economy that can distribute wealth within that. So in a nutshell, the economy underwrites. Dr. Uh, we, we have 12 more minutes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, so the economy underwrites our, um, our, all our socioeconomic welfare. So none of us can get away from the economy. And this is very important. Now, how does the society plug in within that? The society is dependent on the economy at household level and at uh, individual level. So the society also is the one that diverts resources to support the uh, government through taxes and levies, but it's also the one that gives back to the religious institutions. So once the economy is not able to distribute the incomes and wealth to the society, then it means that the religious community will be affected. But also when the socioeconomic welfare of the society is not enough, then they also become a problem at the political level. And this is why you see institutions and many governments are focusing on ensuring fair distribution of wealth within the economy, because that's the assurance. And it's only the economy that can give us that assurance. Now, the things that we are talking about relating the political, religious, and government, if you look at public services or public goods and services, things like education, things like health, things of environment, security, human rights, all those are also issues of faith. Because when you look at the religious teaching, religious takes care of the welfare of the economy. So in fact, you look at some of the extreme debates around the role of religion within uh, the state, there are some people who feel that if religion did their work, because the religion takes care of the poor and the needy, if they did their work, then probably we will not need the state. Those are the extreme views. But the religious community needs to realize that the matters of the state are also matters of faith. And that's why we, we are talking about their prophetic law. If people do not have incomes, if people do not have jobs, the people go to church, they go to mosques, and if they're in church and in mosque, the church has an obligation to take care of those people if they do not have incomes. And we are saying the political leaders have role and they dictate the, the policy of the state. So it's in the interest of them, the religious community, to ensure the right political leaders are in control because they do not, then the burden shifts back to the religious community. Now, how do we contextualize this? in terms of history, where the church and the practical perspective within the country. Now, I've looked at this within four parameters. There's what we were calling the early church. In the early church, uh, there was no distinction between state and religion. And you can look at the teachings in the Bible, for example. And even when you look at the kingdom of Israel, prophets had a very important role um, in, the, in the administration of government. There were also people like uh, St. Apros of Milan, Crossum of Cons, and Leo in Rome. These were very strong bishops and religious leaders who also participated a lot in advancing or influencing policy at the state level. But then somewhere along the way, uh, what we call the dark age of the Western Europe, there was a point when church and when religion or church and state were separated. And then they came like two separate entities that were parallel from each other. And around that, or because of that separation, there are a lot of things that happened. We know that almost 300 years of slave trade, there was atrocities of colonialism. And most recently, we had appetite in South Africa, where the church seemed to be silent on issues of human rights, social justice, and socioeconomic welfare within the community. Then we had the Industrial Revolution, where issues of labor rights and working environment were critical. And we see the church didn't seem to be pronounced around that time. And then we saw the rise of human rights, 
so sorry, civil society and human rights activists, people like Malcolm X, they rose around that. So the church missed a very critical opportunity, probably. And now we are another era when we are talking about the knowledge and digital era, where social media is shaping economies and society and issues of climate change and others. So the church does not seem to be, or the religious community does not be, seem to be very strong in influencing the outcomes of this. That they are driving politics and the economy. But when you look at it within the Kenyan perspective or in the Kenyan context, we can look at the country, the, the history of the country within the, uh, the, the post-colonial era. Now, before the colonial era, um, we had the scripture, the Bareb, where scripture was brought by colonialists and they practiced oppression and economic ex exclusion of the local communities. But also the one good thing that happened, they brought education and civilization. So, so that brings a lot of confusion of the role of the church within the economy, if you look at it in that context. But then we had the next era that I look at, the one-party rule. The issue of um, one-party rule that seems to be a dictatorship and suppression of Congo opinions, but there was also a lot of economic marginalization or probably perceived persons who are supposed to not be or bland with the party dictates at that time. But there was also issues of violation of human rights, the detention without prior and all the others. And out of that, we see the church rising, especially in the late 80s and 90s, when they started speaking about reforms at the political level and also at the constitutional level. And we have the famous actors like um, Dingi Mwananzeki, uh, Reverend Gitari and Joya. These were very strong voices of the church that were arguing against um, violation of human rights and social justice. And it's out of that then we had the birth of the Maud Party democracy, <clears throat> where some of the reformers got into government and we are saying we have had mixed outcomes within this. Um, so you look at the data. For example, when President Kibaki became the president, look at the economic data. This was a period of very great expansion um, at the economy level. And you look at this role within the Fungamano initiatives and the participation. And also some of the governors that we have, for example, Governor Kibuna Kibwana and Professor Yang Yong, these were very key actors within the civil reforms and probably are some of the most accessible uh, governors that we have today. So after that, um, the role of the religious seems to have been lost. And one of the biggest indictments within the local economy was the uh, post-election violence of 2007, where people felt even the church should not be involved. They felt that it took sides. And you can look at the consequences of the post-election violence. It was only two weeks, but the consequences in the economy were quite high because we moved from a growth of about 7.2% to an economic growth of almost negative two. And then uh, the, from the modern democracy, we have had the changes. Now we are, we are moving to what we are now, I'm calling social activism. And this is the, the, the trap that we seem to be in right now. We are talking of an economic system where we are moving to more social welfare, where we are talking about handouts and in whichever form, whether we call it bottom up or we call about cash transfers to uh, young people or poor households. Now, this is a very controversial policy. Now, can we ignore it? The answer is no, because where is it coming from? It's coming from very senior uh, political leaders. If they get elected into power, you expect what they are campaigning around to become policy. Now, the question is at the economic level, how do you grow an economy on social welfare? Even most developed countries have not been able to sustain social welfare. You go to countries like the US, unemployment coupons are treated in a very negative way. But here we have a poor country seem to be tending to social welfare then if you're moving towards social welfare, are you telling people they shouldn't be productive? Why are you telling the young population? Are they supposed to be productive? Are they supposed to look forward to a time when they'll be able to work and be paid within the economy? So this is a very dangerous uh, trade that probably the religious community need to speak about. And when you're talking about this, as the political leaders advance this theory, the church is silent. Yet, we have the millions of young people within the religious communities. 
they are the people in the church. And we need to start thinking about how can then we be saving this economic narrative at the political level. So when you look at the policy options and the interventions, uh, we are saying that religious community cannot engage the political structures and institutions by simply giving random statements. For you to be able to intervene at the political level and at the leadership level, then you need a very structured engagement. And the religious community need to support policy initiative that advance socioeconomic welfare. But they must also be strong enough to speak against policies that undermine the socioeconomic welfare of the society. The second thing that we're saying is that the religious community needs to, to realize that it is also underwritten by the economy. While the government collects taxes through mandatory provisions, the religious community depends on polluted contributions of the society. But all of them, in fact, in another way, um, what we give in churches could be also be seen as a form of tax. So we need to understand that whether we engage in the political level or not, the economy will eventually reflect to, on us at some point. Then the, that policy is to appreciate the role of political institutions. We have said they dictate public policy. And if they dictate public policy and the religious community is the custodian of morals and values within the society, then it is in the interest of the religious community to ensure the right people man the political institutions, because eventually they will determine the burden that eventually falls back to the religious community. And the fourth option is that uh, to positively influence political leadership, they must have the capacity. You cannot influence politics unless you understand the dynamics between politics and the economy. So it is in the interest of the religious community to build their capacity and to be able to engage um, constructively within political process. Now, when we look at the game of politics, politics is controlled by two things. Number one, it is interests. And when you talk about interest in politics, you're simply talking about economics. And the second one is numbers. In a democratic process, you become a leader through numbers. So the religious community control numbers. Because you look at every single worship day, you can imagine how many people congregate on Saturday and Sunday for Christians, and how many people congregate on Friday for Muslims. So the religious community has authority over these people, and they control that, which is a lot of, of a lot of interest to the political institutions. And that's why you're seeing politicians jumping all over within the religious institutions. And you can see even them, they try to associate with the religious community during elections, because the religious community control a very critical variable in politics, which is the numbers. And if they do not agree, then there cannot be a vacuum. Wind up, Doctor, maybe in one minute's time now. Thank you. Okay. So the last uh, concluding thought I'll leave with is a quote by Abraham Lincoln. And he says, I see in the near future a crisis approaching that unnerves me and causes me to tremble for the safety of my country. Corporations have been enthroned and an era of corruption in high places will follow. And the money power of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people until all wealth is segregated in a few ants and the republic is destroyed. And if you look at the history of America, you can actually look at the elections of 1894 where the three people tried to buy actually the presidency. And this is what is happening at the moment. Here we talk about the invisible ant. And these are people we know, they are deep pocket and probably try to um, control their political outcomes so that they can control the economic outcomes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dexary, colleagues. I think we uh, have received a wonderful uh, lecture from um, uh, Dr. Patrick. Indeed, he has taken us through uh, the economics component in terms of uh, uh, the country's status, in terms of revenue, and what uh, the other sources of revenue, like the public debt, and indeed a true situation, getting the statistics from the current 
a document that is uh, the Economic Survey uh, 2021. And they have taken us through showing indeed what the uh, church should play. Most interestingly, and indeed I'm sure he, uh, Dr. Arias, is that even the leaders, the so-called political leaders in our country are also at the same time religious leaders because they are normally in church. Some of them preach. So they really understand what the religious doctrines are. But the question is, why not applying them? And do they influence each other? I'm sure we have really gained food. That's, uh, that's a wonderful um, insight. And uh, at least we appreciate. So colleagues, can we give uh, Daktari three factorial claps? Three factorial, please, loud and clear. One, two, three. One, two, one. Thank you so much, Daktari. I now take uh, this opportunity to uh, welcome Dr. Kamaria and uh, Dr. Patricia Mwendo to take us through the plenary. Karibu Kamaria. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Mbuki. Uh, to our presenter, Dr. Mwende, that's a very wonderful presentation. I really was um, very much uh, inspired by that presentation being a scholar of religion. And we say that um, the areas you've touched, especially in religious circles, they are very critical because we teach religion and politics. We also teach religion and economy. And this issue of <clears throat> religion, uh, politics, and economy is uh, very controversial. It has been there from the early ages, as you have well captured. We have transitioned with it to the modern times, and still it's an elephant in the room. I like the way you have unpackaged the whole uh, concept and so much uh, about the way forward that you have given. Uh, now that uh, in the interest of time, uh, I, uh, of course, we have to see, we have a lot of questions that uh, abound from your discussion. And so may I request uh, my colleague, Dr. Patricia, if you are present, maybe you can say something. Dr. Patricia, Mwendo, are you available? I was scrolling through to find out the uh, the people who have logged in, but I can I, I can see she's not around. So allow me to uh, take you through this discussion discussion session session. Uh, 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 and I start by first of all requesting the members who would uh, if you have a question the people who have been following so this lecture very well if you have a question i'll give you an opportunity to do so you can raise your question by typing your question in the public chat forum or just raise up your hand of course when you want to raise up your hand when you want to raise up your hand uh, maybe what you can do is you uh, you go to the um the you are logging you are logging in and then you can uh, actually raise up your hand and then i'll give you an opportunity so time is now i can see a few people are typing and uh Daktari, dr mwinde you can see from the public chat that people have really appreciated your presentation uh from uh Edwin Karioki is one of my students in religion, has really congratulated you, congrats. Then Everin Modeu, very insightful presentation. And uh, the rights of uh, Professor Rob and uh, Winnie, excellent presentation. So you see that as it's coming. So may I request that the people who may want to have some questions, please do this is your time. And as I prepare, uh, I would like you to look at uh, what uh, the CPA, Mr. John, Gu John Gure has said. He has said, uh, thanks Dr. Mumo, as per the presentation, or uh, as per the presentation with support of data, a lot is required 
from us to steer the country forward. Uh, those are a few comments that are coming up. But as you do that, of mm -hmm. course, there are a few reflections that I would like us to to, uh, to post. For example, uh, does, do you have to be religious? For example, do you have to be religious to know that indeed corruption is a vice? Do we have to be religious? Does one need to be religious to know that uh, to be corrupt is not good or is a vice? Then look at the, the, the kind of <coughs> uh, the, the society we are having. If you look at religion, explore the philosophy of religion or the philosophies of major world religions. Then you look at politics, explore the philosophy of politics and the philosophy of economy. Do they converge? Do they diverge? And is there a meeting point between the three? I would like to call them the triangular forces, religion, politics, and economy. Are there some points of convergence and the points of divergence? And what are their strengths? Then in Kenya, can we call ourselves a religious or a political state? And if indeed we are a religious state, if indeed we are a political state, do religious uh, do, does religion have a niche uh, in matters of politics? And if we are a religious state, do politics have a niche in religious affairs? And then look at the ambivalence of religion in matters of conflict and religion, uh, relig uh, of peace and conflict. Religion is a very good factor in bringing about peace. Bring, talking about ethical or moral issues. At the same time, religion has a lot of overtones that... Hey, hey, Dr. Kamari, yeah? Yes? Yeah, there are a number of people whose hands are up, so please don't uh, yes. take much of the time. They also need to ask something. Yeah? Yes, yes, I'm charging them so that they are able to charge the presenter. You know, if they are not charged, they are not going to assist this presentation. <laughs> So let me charge them a bit. So the issue is the conflicts that are there. Religion is the source of conflict, is the religion of peace. It is, is also the, the source of peace. So let us find a way of maybe, you know, I'm sure this is be beginning to give you some food of some food for thought. So with that, with those few many remarks, can I request that uh, the, pre the uh, there are some questions that are posed? Whose hands is up? Just put on your mic and please post your post your question to the presenter. Yes, I'd seen Professor Henry. No, I'm the one using Henry's uh, laptop. Oh, okay. But, uh, I'll quickly ask. I'll quickly Maybe ask you, you uh, this question. Uh, what is your definition or understanding of religion? Given that uh, religion has to do with supernaturals, and that supernaturals do not have economy, they do not engage in economic activities. So then how are they able to influence economic activities in a fiscal world where they do not exist, and then make others who believe in them to influence the leadership of other places. <laughs> well, who told you spirits have no economy? <laughs> the, the supernatural have... <laughs> it's interesting, Dr. Tari, maybe you can do something about that. But it's yeah. interesting to hear. <laughs> That's a good question. Let me have another one. Maybe you can uh, respond to an array of questions so that we do not have one one. Another one, but I like that one. Yeah. <laughs> Another question, please, from the floor. Yes, I saw several hands. Yes, uh, Prof. Professor Frederick. Yes, I want to appreciate uh, our guest speaker. I think he has given us food for thought. Uh, I would just like him to clarify the concept of triology 
I would have expected the representation to center on three cycles. If three cycles were to be drawn and are uh, intersecting at a particular point, it will have shown us on how religion and the political leadership will interact, how religion and economy interact, how political leadership and uh, so that uh, we now get the meeting point where the three are actually uh, interacting. And then uh, you will have given us a, a, a better understanding that will have helped to answer uh, what Dr. Kamwaria and Dr. <laughs> Wikileaf Amkoa are uh, raising. So could you maybe expound so yeah. that uh, that uh, connecting point of religion, economy, and the uh, political leadership really comes out and maybe pinpoints the common characteristic where each of the two uh, meets. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, Prof, for that brief question. Another question, please. So that uh, the <laughs> representer, Dr. Mumo, can respond to all of them at once in the interest of time. Maybe, Doctor, you could be addressing those two issues, maybe as oh, more okay. hands are coming up. Okay, I think I'll refer to the first one by Dr. Amko uh, um, Wycliffe. Now, this, this is a very interesting question. Um, I probably only restricted myself to the discussion within our context. Uh, if you look at some of the best performing economies that have done extremely well, they actually do not have any religion. Um, like you go to China. China is officially um, an atheist country. They, they do not believe in religion. Actually, to them, um, religion is for hopeless people. But it's one of the countries, if you may learn China, it's one of the countries with the least corruption index. And you look at uh, how they do things. It's quite amazing that they do not have any affiliation to any religious faith. And they seem to be doing extremely well in terms of the economics. But when you look at our context, and this is where um, uh, the debate is becoming a bit interesting. You look at the last two election election cycles, uh, especially between 2013 and 2017, the mobilization was around a god, where some felt um, it is God and the other ones were, or some were characterized as being led by God and others were characterized as being um, <clears throat> uh, from the satanic powers or whatever it is. And you look at how it is being appropriated right now, even in the current political scenario. Everybody and everybody within the political circles seems to be entrusted within the religious community. And you've seen now the, the, the undertones from the church where uh, the question of the money factor, money is simply economics, is also becoming very strong in the debate. So it appears that the only people who have resources within the country seems to be around politics. And the religious community, there's a good article, I think you could check done by uh, Damaris, the elephant, uh, where she's tried to characterize how religion is being appropriated by politicians to mobilize. Remember we have said that politics is about two things, interest and numbers. And when you talk about interest in politics, is simply economics, the economic power. And then there are the numbers. The politicians are interested in the numbers so that they can access the economic power. But who has the numbers? I say the church, being a very religious community in terms of our uh, Christian, uh, Muslim, Hindu, and others. And that's why it's looked at that data and that census where many of us identify with these religious communities and uh, practices and teachings. So um, it becomes of 
a lot of interest to ask yourself why, why the politicians who understand the, the power of the political institutions and the economy, why would they be entrusted so much with the religious community? And this is, this is a question that why would they want to mobilize around that? And, and, and without appearing controversial, you see the issue of the country where many national leaders tried to always associate with the religious community. But when you go back to psychology, uh, look at criminals, look at corrupt people, look at even drunk lords. They always associate somehow. They are actually very huge givers and don um, donors in religious communities. For example, you look at one of the most renowned criminal in countries, I think it was called Wanugu from Yeri. Uh, when he was shot and killed, it was a very huge surprise to the Nyeri community because he was a guy who was supporting people and young orphans and people and helping everybody. But the government knew he was a criminal. And you need to ask yourself, um, we know in psychology that corrupt people, drug dealers and even criminals actually make huge donations to religious um, societies and communities. Why do they do that? Because there's a way of sanitizing their activities because you need, they need to buy goodwill from the community. So when you see religious community get engaging in, sorry, when you see politicians engaging within religious activity, you need to ask yourself why. And why are they doing these huge donations? And then the question is, if the religious community is accepting that, then do they still retain the moral authority? to question, and economics is quite strange a bit because of the economic power. The people of economic power are able to control a lot of things within society and communities. So we can never get a conclusive answer, but there's that controversial debate about money, because when you're talking about money, you're talking about economics. And there's also actually the, the discussion about uh, the diversities within the religious community, for example, the uh, the traditional churches and now the emerging prosperity gospel. So there are a lot of discussions around that. And I think you can go to that article of um, uh, Damaris, the elephant. Uh, she's tried to debate a lot about that. Now, uh, I think it's pro uh, Professor Frederick, the theology. Now, I, when I, look, I was looking at religion, the political leader, uh, leadership and the economy. Now, I said number one, Religious community depend on the economy, but they're also consumers in the economy. Because when you talk about tithes and overings, where do they come from? That's an economic issue. Because you can't give what you don't have. So for me to give, I must earn from the economy. But also the religious community is part of the consumers in the economy. Because they create employment, they buy goods and services within the economy. So that's one convergence between the two. But now, uh, what we have just looked at, why are political leaders interested to be in religious, presence of religious, um, I mean, in, in religious presence? Why are they going there? Because they understand the religious community control the numbers. And these numbers, they want them to gain political power. So as you look at the uh, the, religi the and then the, religi the political leaders who control now what we call the political institutions dictate economic policy. So that's what I'm saying. You see um, a very complex interrelationship uh, between the religion and the teachings and the practices and also the economic activities together with the political power and, 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 and leadership, because you say it, and that's why you say it, as Montlew uh, has talked about uh, political institutions and economy. So you can never talk about an economy without politics in a democracy, because political leaders dictate public policy. They will dictate what education system we are going to have. They dictate what healthcare system we are going to have. They dictate the business environment. So it's very misinformed for anybody to imagine that they can fail to engage within the political system and thrive within the economy. 
So that cannot happen. So when you look at politics, politics is driven by interest, and interest is economics. But then the religious community control the numbers, and politicians are interested in the numbers. So when you look at the cycle, it's around that. But overall, we are all underwritten by the economy. So the religious community cannot thrive when the economy is dysfunctional. And that's why I'm saying there's no way you can talk about one without the other. And that's why we're saying the religious community need to have a lot of interest on who controls the political institutions, because ultimately they will determine the economic institutions. And once you have extractive political institutions, then they highly undermine the economic institutions. But we are saying the economic institutions have their own independent forces, what we are calling the market forces. And the danger of the political leadership being, sorry, the religious community being quiet or silent during the political process is that those who have the economic power dictate the outcome at the political level. And once they dictate the outcome at the political level, then they control the economy. And that's why we are hearing this debate about deep state. What is deep state? Deep state is simply people who are pulling the economic power behind the scenes. And the others or the rest of us simply become pawns in that game. So, so there's a very um, complex interrelationships among the three. And that's why we're saying one can never exist in exclusion of the other. So when you look at a religious community like us, where we say we are Christians, we are Muslims, and we are all this, uh, then, then, then uh, we, we need to look at the teachings of that and see how it reflects at the political and at the economic level. So, so I think that's how I look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Are we still there? Dr. Kamari, are you with us? Um, if, if he's not available, let me take over. Any other question? Maybe we'll only ask two questions and then we'll close. It seems like there are no questions. Okay. Uh, then I request Professor Gola to give a vote of thanks. Yeah, thank you, Registrar. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity. I begin by appreciating our chief guest and, of course, the university management for the support and uh, the DVC reel, uh, especially for taking the lead uh, to strengthen dissemination of knowledge. And this public lecture is one of the activity that actually brings uh, people of different uh, level of understanding together to have a, a forum for sharing knowledge. And uh, Dr. Mumo, you have done it so well. In this forum, we have our students, they have attended the presentation. We have the lecturers. We have our collaborating partners. You can see Professor uh, Rob from the Quart, and uh, many others are uh, represented in this uh, forum. And uh, the choice of the topic was appropriate. Uh, it has enabled us to have a better understanding on how religion political leadership and economy uh, converge the meeting point of the three and uh, I think the chief guest have brought it out well. I want to appreciate uh, everybody who made a contribution to ensure that uh, this public lecture is a success. Uh, we have 
support from the ICT, ICT team. We have our administrators, you could hear registrar asking Elizabeth, asking Nancy to do something. We appreciate their contributions. And uh, we are grateful uh, to those who are able to get time uh, to be able to attend this uh, public lecture because without them, uh, we will not have uh, been able to be in this forum. So thank you so much. And above all, I want to thank God for enabling us to be alive and uh, to listen to the presentation. So thank you all. I appreciate your attendance. So Registrar, do I close with a word of prayer? Uh, before you close, Sir Henry is here. I'm going to request him to clap for several people. Number one is for the speaker, Dr. Mumo. We also have our external colleagues. I remember talking about um, people like Patrick Silla. We have Professor Nyaranga. We have Njenga David and others. So I request him to give a hand clap to everybody who has participated and then uh, he led you to close with the heart of prayer. From this other side, thank you very much. So, Professor Mbega, back on your mic. Uh, thank you very much, Bwana Registra. Uh, I would like to ask everyone to put on their mic, to, to, un, to un, unmute their mic so that we can clap together for the wonderful speaker who has given us a wonderful speech. Uh, we shall, um, I'll be demonstrating as we go along. Uh, so we shall clap for Mumo, 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 Mumo. Ah. Nasema Mumo, Mumo, Mumo. Ah. Then it will, when I pronounce, to clap, 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 and then we finish it. Ah. Ah. Twende. Mumo, 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 Mumo. Ah. Asante sana, Mumo, Mumo. Ah. Na wale wageni wengine ambao mekuja, wageni, wageni. Wageni, 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 wageni. Ah. Wageni, wageni, wageni. Now for everyone, we want blessings to come. So to the club, mvua inyeshe, mvua inyeshe, and then we say, baraka zingie. Ha, twende? Mvua inyeshe, mvua inyeshe, baraka zingie. Ha, mvua inyeshe, mvua inyeshe, baraka zingie. Ha, thank you very much. Um, barikiwe sana. <laughs> Professor Gola, now you can uh, close with the word of prayer. So let's uh, uh, pray. God, we come to you this afternoon to appreciate the grace and the glory and the sharing of knowledge that you have been able to gain. Uh, you normally tell us that uh, my people suffer for lack of knowledge, and uh, our uh, guest speaker, Dr. Mumo, has really brought it out by getting a clear connection between religion, political leadership, and the economy. We also pray for the university management, for the support, the VC, or the VBCs, uh, the students, members of staff, our collaborative partners, and all those who made contribution to make sure that uh, this public lecture is a success. We appreciate your glory and your support in ensuring that uh, Machakos University is able to undertake its various activities and focus on its areas of uh, disseminating knowledge and sharing of knowledge, uh, which is key in ensuring that people are able to progress People are able to be creative, people are able to understand issues in a better way, and it widens their spectrum of understanding. And it's a meeting, a meeting, and trusting in Jesus' name. Hello. Ukapi? Ukapi? Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me come.
Bye bye everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.